Welcome to week two of Introduction to Horse Science. For this week, we will be, over, be going over breeds, types, and classes of horses. So there will be two lectures this week, so we'll have lecture 2A and 2B, and it will both be over um, breeds, types, and classes of horses. Through selection, inbreeding, and outcrossing, humans have created horses for speed, strength, endurance, size, good nature, hardiness, beauty, as well as athletic ability. Today, there are over 300 breeds that exist. These breeds represent numerous types and classes of horses. The various breeds and types of horses are also bred to donkeys to produce different types of mules. So we'll talk more about um, breeding of donkeys and horses together to produce different types of mules throughout um, the end of this lecture. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with week two of Introduction to Horse Science. So kicking off with a little bit of an introduction of what exactly are breeds or different breeds of horses. Through selective breeding, people have learned to develop specific desirable characteristics within a group of horses. After a few generations of selective breeding, a breed of horse is then going to be developed. A breed of horse is a group of horses with a common ancestry that breed true to produce common characteristics. These common characteristics can include function, conformation, as well as color. Breeding true means that the off offspring will almost always possess the same physical characteristics as the parents. So when we talk about a breed of horses and this group of horses with a common ancestry, they are going to breed true. So breeding true um, was previously defined as the offspring will almost always possess the same characteristics as the parents. Recognized breeds of horses have an association with a stud book and breeding records. Many record recognized breeds have certain foundation sires, and all registered foals must trace their ancestry back to these stallions. A couple examples of this include um, Justin Morgan, which is the foundation sire of the Morgan horse breed, as well as Allen F1, which is a Morgan stallion, is the foundation sire of the Tennessee walking horse. Within breeds, we also have color breed registrations. So color breed registrations are going to be a little bit unique and these are not going to breed true. So people who found particular colors appealing established registries with color requirements. Some of these registries require only one color for registration, but others have confirmation standards as well that come into play. The Palomino Horse Association of California was the first color breed registration um, to be set up and organized. Other color breed registries now include Appaloosas, Albinos, Paints, Pintos, Buckskins, Whites, Creams, as well as Spotted Horses. It's important to note that when we're talking about these color breed registries, that color breeds do not breed true. So when we talked about that selective breeding, and we're talking about our breeds of horses with common ancestries that breed true, so we're talking about our American Quarter Horses, our Thoroughbreds, our Arabians, just to list a few, these are going to breed true, meaning that their offspring will almost always possess the same physical characteristics as the parents. When we start talking about these color breed registries, this is not true. Color breeds do not breed true. We will talk about specific breeds of horses in greater detail in the second lecture of this week, but we're going to go ahead um, and introduce not only breeds, but also other ways that we can classify um, and categorize horses into different types. So moving into um, classification and types of horses. In addition to breeds, horses can be classified several different ways. 
Um, an example of this includes grouping horses as light, draft, or pony according to their size, their weight, as well as their build. Within these groups, horses can then be further divided by their uses. Examples of this include riding horses, racing, driving, jumping, or utility. Furthermore, um, we can classify them as warm blood, cold blood, or ponies. So lots of different classifications and types of horses and how we can do so. And obviously, each individual horse is going to fit into multiple categories. Horse classifications depending on the height and weight of the horse. The common measurement of the horse is in hands. The height of a horse is measured from the top of the withers to the ground. So as we get into anatomy and conformation, we'll go through different parts of the horse um, to locate where the withers is at. A little quick descriptor on withers, you can see it, see it on the right hand photograph. The withers is going to be on the back at the top of the shoulder. So right there where we're going to locate um, the front of our saddle is going to be where our withers are located on our horse. So when we're measuring height, we're going to measure from the top of the withers to the ground. This is going to be considered the height of our horse. A hand is going to be equal to four inches. So an example of this is a horse that is 15 hands is going to be 60 inches. So 15 times 4 is 60. So that horse is 60 inches, but commonly we're going to reference them as being 15 hands tall. Um, another example would be a horse that is 15 two. So a horse that is 15 hands and 2 inches is going to be 62 inches tall from the top of the withers to the ground. So again, later on as we move through the semester, we'll talk about how to take a horse's weight, how to measure their height, so on and so forth. But a basic overview of height, you can see that we're measuring in hands, that a hand is equal to four inches. Um, a big pet peeve or per se way to make sure that you are correct in referencing height in horses is there's no possible way that we can have a horse that is 15'5" because we have four inch increments within a hand. So at no point will we ever have a horse that is 15.5. We can have a horse that's 15.1, 15.2, 15.3. At the point we get to 15.4, that would be incorrect. That horse would be 16 hands tall. So just keep in mind, um, keep in mind that little technicality per se of when we're referencing height within horses. And we'll talk about that in more detail later on in the semester. So to get started with these classifications and types, we'll first cover light horses, draft horses, and then ponies, and how these three are classified um, differently. So our light horses are going to be 12 to 17.2 hands, and they're going to weigh approximately 900 to 1400 pounds. They're used primarily for riding, driving, showing, racing, or utility on farm and ranches. Light horses are going to be capable of more action and greater speed than those of the draft horses. When we get into the classification of a draft horse, a draft horse is going to commonly be 14.2 to 17.2 hands tall, and they are going to weigh greater than 1,400 pounds. They are primarily used for heavy work or pulling loads, and historically, when draft horses were bought and sold for work, they were classified according to their use, such as wagging, pulling, or plowing, just to give you a couple of examples. And then we have our ponies. Our ponies are going to stand 14.2 hands or less and weigh 500 to 900 pounds. So in giving you these weight classifications, um, clearly horses that are conditioned for work and horses that are out of shape or horses that are at different stages in the growth process and different ages. These poundages aren't per se a true requirement. They just give you a reference point. Um, so ponies are going to possess a distinct conformation on a reduced scale and they are either draft, heavy harness, or saddle type. So within ponies we have those three different classifications. Moving on, now we'll look at warm bloods versus cold bloods. A warm blood doesn't relate to a horse with a certain blood temperature, as it may suggest, but instead it refers to the overall temperament 
of light to medium horse breeds. Warm blood horses are going to be fine boned and they're going to be suitable for riding. In some countries, the warm blood is distinguished as a horse that has a strand of Arabian breeding. So Arabian breeding and bloodline um, has been influential on the development of that breed. Um, some groups classify all light horses as warm bloods. And according to some, all breeds are, that are not definitely thoroughbred, draft, or pony can be classified as a warm blood. So there's a little bit of technicality um, on classifying as a warm blood and a little bit of differences in how one may classify depending on what country or what region um, that you are located at. Looking at our cold blood, our cold blood horses are going to be heavy, solid, strong horses with a very calm temperament. This term is probably best thought of as another way of describing a draft horse because of that very calm temperament in this style of horse. So moving further into ways of classifying and putting horses into different categories per se, we have types and uses. So types of light, horse, uh, light horses include riding, racing, showing, driving, all-purpose, as well as miniature. Riding horses are going to be generally thought of as either gated horses, so three or five gated, stock horses for, as well as equ horses for equine sports, and ponies for riding and driving. Then with our racing horses, racing horses are running race horses, pacing or trotting race horses, the quarter horses that are running on a track, as well as harness race horses. So lots of different groups of horses that are going to fit in different types of racing. Then we have driving horses, which is in going to include heavy and fine harness horses, ponies, as well as roadsters. All purpose horses and ponies are used for family enjoyment, showing, ranch work, and the like. And then we have our miniature horses and donkeys that are used for driving as well as commonly for pets. So I know um, during our first lab meeting, um, I did have one of the students ask about you know, Romeo and what we do with miniature horses. What is the purpose of a miniature? So we'll talk about that in a little bit of detail in the later lectures. Um, obviously, some breeds are going to fit better into some of these types than other breeds, or they may fit in varying types. So, for example, when we look at classifying these horses by types and uses, and we look at the American Quarter Horse. Um, the American Quarter Horse is used as a riding horse, as it is a stock horse. The American Quarter Horse can also be used for racing, as they're commonly used in the quarter mile race. We can use... Um, our quarter horses for showing and we can use them as all-purpose horses they can be horses um, that are used for family enjoyment that they're showing they're doing ranch work um, so we can classify them as that all-purpose horse so depending on that individual animal is sometimes going to depend on how we classify them so looking further into that example you know we classify them as an American quarter horse we would then classify them as a light horse, and then when we look at types and uses, we can further classify them depending on what specifically that animal is used for. So keep in mind that the individual animal is going to influence a couple of these classifications. Moving into rare breeds. Um, some breeds are threatened because American agriculture has drastically changed in recent years. So previously, kind of when we talked about the first lecture we did on horses and evolution and changes throughout history and how they're used in the U.S. and then how that has changed um, from the beginning of time in the U.S. and then to currently where we are. So previously, our horses were primarily used for work and currently our horses are primarily a means of pleasure, sport, showing, enjoyment. So the tables have significantly turned as technological advancements. Um, the gasoline-powered engine has largely taken the role that the horse previously played in work 
and now they're more of a leisure experience. So some breeds are being threatened because of this change within American agriculture. Many traditional livestock breeds have lost popularity and are threatened with extinction. Um, traditional breeds are an essential part of the American agriculture and heritage. They evoke our past and represent an important resource for the Earth's biodiversity in the future. Rare breeds are classified by the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy. A breed status is going to be considered critical when fewer than 200 animals are registered annually within the United States, so less than 200 animals annually registered in the United States, and then the estimated global population is less than 2,000. This is when we're going to consider this breed of horse to be uh, critical. A couple examples of critical uh, breed classifications today include the American Cream, the Cleveland Bay, the Dow's Pony, the Hackney Pony, the Morgan, the Newfoundland Pony, the Shire, and the Suffolk. The Shire and the Suffolk, Suffolk are going to be draft breed of horses. So that's just a couple of horses that are considered to be critical. The colonial Spanish strains, so descendants of a common ancestor, include horses registered by the Spanish Mustang Registry, the Southwest Spanish Mustang Association, the Spanish Bar Breeders Association, Horse of the Americas, and the American Indian Horse Registry. Next we have um, our horses breeds that are considered to be threatened. A breed status is considered threatened when fewer than a thousand registrations occur annually in the United States and then the estimated global population is less than 5,000. A couple of horse breeds that are considered to be threatened are the Clydesdale, the Colonial Spanish strains, so we just explained a little bit about that um, previously when prior to getting into the threat I explained what um, groups were classified within the colonial um, Spanish strains, as well as the Lipizzan. Next we have our watch list. So breeds with fewer than 2,500 annual registrations in the United States and an estimated global population less than 10,000 are on the watch list. This also includes breeds that present genetic um, concerns or have a limited geographic distribution. Breeds that are on the watch list um, include the Fell Pony, the Gotland, and then the Mountain Pleasure or the Rocky Mountain Horse. So as you'll remember, when you watched the first lecture last week with the introduction, um, I do have some personal ties to the Rocky Mountain Horse. So the Rocky Mountain Horse is going to be considered a horse that is on the watch list, a horse that is fairly popular and common within Kentucky um, and also to Bowling Green itself. Some breeds that were once listed as critical or threatened are now considered to be recovering. Breeds that are classified as recovering um, are when individuals or organizations have taken an initiative to save um, a rare or critical breed. So breeds that are included and in considered recovering are the Belgian, the Frisian, and the Percheron. Again, all three of these, the Belgian, the Frisian, and the Percheron, these are all draft horse breeds. Now to discuss specifically wild horses. <clears throat> wild horses were once domesticated and have become wild are called feral horses. Um, feral horses can also be referred to as a mustang. So mustangs are a breed of horse. No one knows exactly why where, when, and how the first horses escaped from or were stolen from the Spaniards in America. However, during the 1700s and 1800s, the number of feral horses in America was estimated to be 2 to 5 million. Most of these were located within the southwest United States. 
Currently, habitants of feral horses are found in California, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, as well as Wyoming. These habitats are public lands administered by the United States Bureau of Land Management, also referred to as the BLM and the United States Forest Service. Some horses on these lands have been feral for many generations, but others have been recently released. Um, examples of this include people who release their old horses or when owners can no longer afford them and they are released onto public land. Um, so there's actually a large issue within the United States um, today and even further than the United States of the unwanted horse. So unwanted horses come about for varying reasons. I actually have a, an entire lecture um, that I do in horse production on the unwanted <coughs> horse and how we can address that situation. As you can see, my dogs are probably not enjoying this lecture too much tonight. <coughs> Um, but I do have an entire lecture on the unwanted horse, and examples of that include when individuals no longer want their horses um, or when they can no longer afford them. And there's limited resources available to individuals. We do have um, rescues. There's options when older horses, they can be put down um, humanely. Um, and then with the horse market being the way it currently is, oftentimes these horses can't be sold for a profit. They're given away. Um, slaughter is no longer an option within the United States as all of our facilities um, within the United States are closed to slaughter opportunities. And so because of that, it really limits your resources that are available for the unwanted horse. And so that's when instances occur when these horses are being turned out um, turned out on public land so that the individual doesn't have the burden of the animal anymore. So rather unfair to the animal um, and individual too per se, but that is of concern when we're looking at these wild horses. Public concern for um, federal horses led to the passage of two federal laws to protect them. So these two laws that are going to protect um, feral horses include public laws 86234 as well as 92195. The BLM, so the Bureau of Land Management, periodically gathers and removes wild horses to maintain each herd at its appropriate management level. Um, excess animals are made available to the public through the National Adopt-A-Horse and Burrow Program. So those are programs where when these horses are rounded up, then um, the excess horses that the land cannot support, so whether they be horses or burrows, where they are adopted out to individuals. We're now ready to transition from wild horses into donkeys. For donkeys, the breeds registered by the American Donkey and Mule Society, which was founded in 1968, include the Mammoth, or the American Standard Jack, the long, Large Standard Donkey, or the Spanish Donkey, the Standard Donkey, also referred to as the Burro, the Miniature Mediterranean Donkey, as well as the American Spotted Ass. So these are the different breeds um, registered by the American Donkey and Mule Society. The mammoth breed is a blend of several breeds of jack stock that were first imported into the United States in the 1800s from Southern Europe. It is the largest of the asses with the jacks being 56 inches or more in height. The foundation sire was a jack named Mammoth, hence their name, as his name was given to the breed. Currently, the American Mammoth is listed as threatened by the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy. The large standard donkey, also referred to as the Spanish donkey, is between 48 and 56 inches in height, while the standard donkey, also referred to as the burro, is between 36 and 48 inches in height. The miniature Mediterranean donkey was originally imported it must be under 36 inches, 
down from the original 38 inches to qualify for registration. So in order for that miniature Mediterranean donkey to be registered, they must be under 36 inches in height. The height restriction is the only requirement for registering by the American Donkey and Mule Society. The American Spotted Ass is a trademark of the American Council of Spotted Asses founded in 1967 and it can be registered as either white with colored spots or colored with white spots. However, the spots have to be above the knees and hocks and behind the throat latch. Stockings and face markings do not qualify for spotted. So then we have our miniature donkeys. So our miniature donkeys, um, that registry was founded in 1958, the Miniature Donkey Registry of the United States. It is currently governed by the American Donkey and Mule Society. The color and other considerations such as ancestry do not define the miniature donkey. The only requirement is that it be 36 inches or less in height. So when we're talking about miniature donkeys, miniature horses, we're going to measure those um, animals in inches rather than measuring them in hands. So keep that in mind when we're talking about the height requirement with our miniatures is that we're measuring those in inches instead of hands as we would measure our full-sized horses. The original imported donkeys had the typical gray and dun color in which the hairs are all gray and not mixed with white hairs. All shades of brown are also common, and black, white, roan, and spots are also possible. True gray is extremely rare in donkeys of any size and is distinguished from gray dun because true gray donkeys are born with a dark coat that lightens to almost white over the years. As we talk more about genetics and coat coloring in the week to, weeks to come, It'll make a little more sense on how we can um, distinguish our, our true grays and our roans from one another. Another characteristic of the donkey is the cross, um, consisting of a dorsal stripe from the mane to tail and a cross stripe between the withers. In black animals, the cross marking may be difficult to visualize or detect. The miniature donkey with good conformation should give the impression of being small, compact, and well-rounded, with four straight, strong legs and all parts in symmetry and balance. The coat of the miniature donkey is not as thick in winter as the coat of larger donkeys, probably because it's ancestry from climates within the Mediterranean. Although the most obvious use of donkeys is as a pet, they can also be used as companions to foals at weaning time to relieve foal stress, as they're calm also serves when they are used as companions for nervous horses or horses that are recovering from surgery. They do not take up much room in the stall but have a great calming effect. So a lot of your, or I say a lot, a number um, of your show horses that may be higher strung may have a companion animal that travels to shows with them. Um, one of the most common examples I would think of is Fallon Taylor. Um, her her horse that she's most well known for for running barrels is Baby Flo, and Baby Flo does have a companion animal that is a goat. Um, so similarly, these miniature donkeys can be used as companion animals um, for other horses that, that may need that calming effect. The miniature donkey is on the recovering list of the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy. Next we have our mules. A mule um, is rather unique as it is going to be a cross between a donkey and a horse. When we have a cross between a donkey or a horse, then we're going to call this a mule or a henny, depending on its parentage. A mule is the offspring of a male donkey, so a male donkey is what we refer to as a jack, and then a female horse, so a female horse is a mare. So a mule is the offspring of of a male donkey and a female horse. It is like the horse in size and body shape, but has the shorter, thicker head, longer ears, and brain voice of the donkey. Mules also lack, as does the donkey, the horse's calluses or chestnuts on the hind legs. The reverse cross between a male horse, so a stallion, and a female donkey 
a jenny is a henny. So a henny results when we cross a male horse and a female donkey. A henny is similar to the mule in appearance, but is smaller and more horse-like with shorter ears and a longer head. It has the stripe of other color patterns of the donkey. There are a number of classifications of mules. Um, historically, mules were classified as draft, sugar, farm, cotton, and then packing and mining mules. Draft and sugar mules were the largest, being 17.2 hands to 16 hands and 1,600 pounds to 1,100 and 500 pounds. Farm and cotton mules were an intermediate in size. And then we have our pack and mining mules that were smaller um, smaller in size than there are intermediate. Um, today, mules are classified as draft, pack, work, saddle, driving, jumping, or miniature. The type of mule produced depends on the breed or type of horse and breed or type of donkey used to produce the mule. And our last topic of discussion um, for this week 2A lecture is a zebra hybrid. A zebra hybrid is an all-encompassing term for a zebra crossed with any other equine species. The term zorse is used to describe the cross of a zebra stallion to a horse mare. Other terms that we can be seen to describe a zebra and horse cross is a Zebrodi, a zoni, which is a zebra and pony cross, or a zioni. Zebra and donkey crosses are termed zebroid, zebras, or zedonk. Zebras may appear to have ponyish bodies, but the hip shape does differ as well in comparison. Zebra's ears are also going to be larger and rounder than horse ears. And the mountain zebras have almost donkey-like ears. So the necks are, characterized, are characteristically straighter in the long ears. And the most donkeys in all zebras lack a true wither. The manes are stiff and upright. And zebras, like donkeys, have no forelocks. Zebras have a variety of noises, most commonly the quay and barking sound. These traits are all passed along in part, just as they are in mules, to zebra hybrid offspring. Most zebra donkey crosses look just like the donkeys with zebra striping on the colored coat. Zebra hybrids, depending on the parents, will be either more horse-like or more ass-like in body shape. They also are typically smaller than most horses or mules, as most zebra breeds are small, even the largest variety is only about 13 hands in height. So now we've arrived at the summary and assignment section of this lecture for lecture 2A. To give a quick summary of this lecture, world worldwide there are about 300 breeds of horses that exist with varying sizes. People have bred and selected horses for specific common characteristics such as function, conformation, as well as color. Horses breeding true or with a common ancestry are registered in breed registry associations. These horses meet the standards defined by the registry. Besides breeds, horses are classified by type such as light, draft, and pony, as well as by use, such as riding, driving, harness, sport, gated, stock, as well as all-purpose. Some breeds have specific purposes, while other breeds serve a variety of usages. Five breeds of donkeys are recognized, and donkeys are crossed with horses to produce mules. The type of mule that results depends largely on the breed and type of donkey and horse used in the cross as both donkeys and horses have miniature types. These miniatures are used for pets and expedition hitches and as companions to sick or nervous horses. Any equine crossed with a zebra is referred to as a zebra hybrid. Zebra donkey crosses um, are also present. 
So with that being said, you should now be able to complete your week 2A assignment. And then I will be posting your week 2B lecture and assignment shortly as we will go over a very number of specific breeds of horses.